uh, take a look at your book and you can see the uh, impressive bio of our first speaker, Dr. Rick Astor from CSU Geosciences Department. Uh, please get, join, join me in welcoming him to the stage. Well, thanks very much. And thanks again to the organizers for bringing together this uh, really important and, uh, and very valuable event. Um, yeah, I'm an earthquake seismologist. I work with uh, both natural and induced uh, earthquakes. And uh, I'm uh, going to give you sort of an overview today. And I realize there's a very diverse audience here. So I'm going to cover some things that uh, if they go a little fast uh, or you see something that uh, you know, doesn't make sense, ask me a quick question. Um, and I apologize, apologies to those of you who know more about oil and gas uh, and uh, exploration than I do. And uh, so there may be some pretty pedantic things in here, too. Uh, let's move forward here. Okay, so I'll talk about what causes earthquakes most generally. Uh, how do we detect, locate, and measure them? This is very important for uh, addressing the issue of induced seismicity. Um, what is an induced earthquake? How do they happen? Uh, where have they historically and recently occurred in the uh, in the U.S.? And uh, what have we learned in the last few years? As um, I'll show you, this is a really, really uh, amazing era in the understanding of this phenomenon, particularly uh, due to what's been happening in Oklahoma over the last few years. So we have learned a lot about this problem and uh, how to manage it. And uh, the upshot of this talk is it's a very manageable problem. And uh, I think uh, both of my uh, co-speakers will uh, also uh, make that point very strongly. So earthquakes, of course, are sources of elastic or seismic waves that propagate within the Earth. Uh, they're a bit like sound waves traveling through solid media because the elasticity of solid media is a bit more complex than air. Uh, seismic waves are a bit more complex, but the sound analog is not a bad one. Uh, most earthquakes arise uh, due to slip on a predisposed weak zone, which is typically a fault within the Earth. Um, and of course, uh, earthquake uh, can start anywhere from very close to the surface to hundreds of miles deep on our planet. Uh, the seismic motion that uh, we perceive at the surface of the Earth arises from the seismic waves radiating away from the source, or the hypocenter, as we call it. And these travel at speeds of several kilometers or more per second. So it takes about uh, 10 minutes for seismic waves to go from one side of the country uh, to the other. They travel very quickly. Uh, what we call a felt earthquake is when the ground motion becomes generally perceptible to human beings. And that occurs when accelerations become greater than a percent or so of the acceleration of, uh, of gravity. Um, so uh, seismic waves, as I said, are a bit more complicated than, than sound waves. The important take-home message here is that there's a quick compressional wave that's much like a sound wave we can detect easily. Uh, there's a shear wave and there are surface waves that travel at the surface of the Earth. The shear waves and surface waves are what can actually cause appreciable damage in most uh, uh, cases where earthquakes do cause damage. So that uh, doesn't look good. There we go. So seismic waves travel very efficiently uh, through the Earth. Um, there's the hypocenter, as I mentioned before. That's the point on what may be a large earthquake fault, but the hypocenter is where the slip starts. Um, and the projection of the hypocenter of the surface is called the epicenter. So we have some sort of seismic uh, source. Um, the seismic waves propagate away from that source. Um, and uh, we make a three-dimensional recording, typically, of the ground motion called a seismogram. So horizontally, we have time there. And uh, you can see two distinct arrivals of energy. Uh, they may be separated by seconds. Or they may be separated by many minutes, depending on how far away the earthquake is. Um, and from these P and S waves, we can learn a lot about the uh, uh, source uh, of the event, or the P and S waves. Uh, this is a movie that unfortunately won't play, but if it did play, uh, it would show you a magnitude 6 earthquake propagating seismic waves across the entire United States. So if anyone's curious about this, I can show it uh, later. So um, how do we record and locate earthquakes? Well, we put out uh, seismographs, which are sensitive instruments that can record ground motion at levels of uh, microns. So they detect motion that's much too small to be perceptible. But really importantly, uh, seismographs let us study earthquakes over a large size range. And as I'll point out, a key uh, aspect of uh, um, understanding seismicity, all right, understanding seismicity um, is to uh, be able to detect the small earthquakes as well as the large ones. Um, so a record of ground motion again is called a seismogram. 
uh, models of how fast seismic waves travel through the Earth uh, allow us to locate uh, where the source is. If we have lots of seismograms and good quality data, uh, we can locate the source quite accurately, sometimes to within uh, meters within the Earth by looking at uh, PNS waves and other features of the uh, seismic signal. Um, typically, though, if you really want to understand an earthquake uh, in terms of how the Earth slipped, exactly how large it was, exactly how deep it was, and where it was, you need a network of seismographs. You can't do it with just one. Um, as shown in this sort of simple cartoon, you have to sort of triangulate around to get a good estimate of the source. So typically, uh, four to eight or more seismographs have to record an earthquake well to really have a, a good handle on how big it is and exactly where it is and what sort of ground motion was involved on the fault. Um, and if you really want to understand how deep it is, you typically need a, a station that's fairly close uh, so that the seismic waves are traveling nearly vertically. Um, so uh, that's uh, all doable in theory, and there are places in the world that are well instrumented. Uh, Colorado, unfortunately, is not an especially well instrumented uh, uh, place uh, for seismographs at this point in time. Um, these colored dots show various types of publicly available seismic data uh, collection points, seismographs run by various uh, agencies from the USGS to um, the uh, Bureau of, of Rec. And you'll see that there are hundreds and hundreds of kilometers between some of these seismographic stations. So for instance, uh, when we had uh, an event in, uh, in Greeley that we were trying to study last year, um, we didn't have seismographs within about 90 kilometers of that event. It made it very difficult to understand what was going on initially. And uh, so the typical response of seismologists is to get some portable instruments and try to chase the aftershocks, uh, which we did with some success. Um, the magnitude of an earthquake uh, is an intrinsic measure of its size, so we try to remove all the propagation effects, get back to the source, and come up with some sort of a quantitative measure of just how big the event is. Um, the important thing about the magnitude scale uh, to realize first off is that it's logarithmic. So an increment of two magnitude units actually corresponds to about a thousand-fold increase in energy. So magnitude four is much bigger than a magnitude two. Um, and uh, sometimes people say, well, can't you just let the stress off by causing lots and lots of really tiny earthquakes? And unfortunately, that's really not feasible because of this power law relationship between the energy of earthquakes. So uh, you would have to uh, induce uh, a thousand magnitude fours to release the same amount of energy within the Earth as a magnitude six. Um, how are they detected and measured? Um, in most regions, uh, uh, there are about 10 times as many earthquakes of magnitude, uh, you know, one unit smaller than a particular magnitude. Uh, this is, seems to be a pervasive relationship for earthquakes all around the world. It's very valuable for forecasting the rates of seismic activity. Um, so there are about 10 times as many magnitude twos as threes, um, and about 1,000 times as many magnitude twos as fives. So there are about 10 times as many earthquakes each time you go down one unit in magnitude. So in theory, uh, this is very valuable because it allows for us to forecast and manage, uh, at least theoretically, seismicity um, by looking at the small earthquakes and then projecting this frequency relationship up to the probability of occurrence of a large earthquake. Um, now there are, uh, uh, you know, some important things that one has to study when one does this. So here's a plot of um, basically a number of earthquakes. This is, you know, factors of 10 here. It's logarithmic and the logarithm of the magnitude, so factors of 10 and magnitude this way. And if you plot the number of earthquakes on a bar chart in a particular region, typically they will fall on uh, almost a straight line in this log-log space. So if you're detecting lots of earthquakes of this size over a time period, you can project out to larger magnitudes, which might be damaging earthquakes, and from there uh, you can get an estimate of, of, the, uh, of the hazard of the, uh, of the process. Um, the, uh, Relationship uh, moves over here at the low magnitudes because we can't record tiny earthquakes. And up at the highest magnitudes, this is a really important point, um, this has to truncate at some maximum magnitude. And the maximum magnitude that an area might produce uh, depends on several factors, including the state of stress within the Earth and the size of the faults. Because to have a large earthquake, you have to have a large fault that's ready to slip. If the uh, pre-existing structure within the Earth does not contain a lot of large faults, 
then this maximum magnitude will be somewhat lower. And so that requires real geologic insight and understanding of the faults within the Earth uh, to, uh, to try to calculate what the maximum credible magnitude might be for a particular area. Um, the intensity, on the other hand, as opposed to magnitude, is actually a measure of how hard the ground shakes in an earthquake. So, um, and uh, it's intimately related to how much damage may occur. Um, uh, intensities are done on this sort of Roman numeral scale that you might see from USGS uh, and other uh, information sources. It ranges from, from not felt to uh, extreme or total damage. Um, typically, uh, you know, uh, intensities of two are sort of a, a curiosity. Intensities of, of five or six uh, start to get uh, uh, serious, and intensities of seven and above can cause uh, significant damage. Um, intensity is a w also a way of studying ancient earthquakes. If we have records of damage or written accounts uh, before the invention of the seismograph, we can try to figure out how big old earthquakes were, and that gives us important estimates on the maximum credible earthquake in a particular area, for example. So here are the isoseismal lines, as we call them, for this rather enigmatic 1882 uh, Denver earthquake, as it's called. It had a, a, an epicenter somewhere, we believe, north and west of Fort Collins. Not much is known about it, but it was close to magnitude uh, uh, 6 or above. Um, the moment uh, of an earthquake is another measure of its size that you may uh, um, uh, encounter. And that's basically uh, a really good physical measure of just how much the Earth slipped uh, and over what area. So the moment is actually just proportional to the fault area times the slip times how strong the elastic uh, 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 rocks are. And uh, from this, we actually calculate a modern magnitude scale. We don't use the Richter scale anymore. We use what's called the moment magnitude scale. And that's typically what you will get from a USGS um, uh, press release uh, or a release from a university. So this is by far the best way we have of measuring relative earthquake sizes. So just to give you some physical um, uh, perspective, a magnitude 2 earthquake using this moment relationship, corresponds to sort of a, a you know, quarter of a football field size fault slipping by one inch. Um, and as you move up within the Earth to you know, tectonically induced earthquakes, of course, this, the areas get much larger and the slips get much larger. Uh, magnitude 2 earthquake wouldn't even show up on this plot. And here's the Sumatra Andaman earthquake here, uh, one of the largest earthquakes of the past century. Um, that uh, is you know, exponentially much, much, much larger than anything uh, we're, uh, we're dealing with here. Um, Earth's a very seismically active planet, of course. There are about 15 magnitude 7 earthquakes a year, 14,000 magnitude 4 plus earthquakes somewhere on the planet. Uh, there's one induced seismic earthquake on this map. It's that one in Oklahoma. Um, and it's a magnitude 4.1 that occurred uh, this month. Um, and you see that it's buried in this cluster of seismic events shown in purple here uh, across Oklahoma. And essentially all these earthquakes are induced. Um, Oklahoma is, is, uh, has in the past five years undertaken an unprecedented geophysical experiment in inducing earthquakes. Um, so uh, this, is, of course, has hazard uh, uh, issues associated with it. Um, there are actually 3,563 other earthquakes on this map in Oklahoma. They're essentially all induced. Um, and this is a particularly stunning plot. The blue curve is the number of magnitude 3 and above earthquakes in California starting in 1973. And the black curve is the number of uh, 3 and above earthquakes in Oklahoma, which has increased exponentially. And the reason it's increased exponentially has been to uh, uh, a huge rise in the uh, disposal of fluids from unconventional hydrocarbon recovery in class two injection wells. Um, so here is uh, this magnitude 4.1 uh, earthquake the other day. Uh, this, is a, this is a really valuable resource just after an earthquake. This is called uh, Did You Feel It? at the USGS. And if you Google Did You Feel It, believe it or not, the first thing you will find is this, is this website. Um, and it's a way for people to go in and report felt ground motion uh, uh, almost immediately after an earthquake, report it by zip code. The USGS tabulates this and produces uh, essentially an intensity map. So you see that the seismic intensity here was around 
five near Stillwater, Oklahoma, in this particular zip code, for example. Um, and then uh, using that and instrumental records, the USGS can actually produce what's called a strong motion shake map that's sort of a smooth contoured uh, version of this uh, very rapidly after any earthquake that's significant. Um, so here we are north of Oklahoma City and again in Stillwater Guthrie area here. Um, we had intensities approaching five from this particular earthquake. Um, so uh, what exactly is an induced earthquake? Well, uh, sort of generically induced earthquake is just an earthquake that would not have occurred if there weren't some human influence applied. Uh, we know there's many ways to produce earthquakes. You can fill reservoirs, which changes the loading on the earth. Um, fracking, by its nature, produces tiny earthquakes. It's not a significant component uh, of, this, uh, of this issue. The big issue is that injection and withdrawal fluids um, can alter the stress state on faults and induce earthquakes. Um, so uh, basically, uh, you know, we go way below the shallow aquifer here, many miles down. Uh, we fracture shale. Um, and uh, that produces tiny earthquakes. Oops. We uh, uh, can uh, withdraw or uh, inject fluids that change the mass, which forces faults in different directions. Um, or the most important, sorry, most important way we induce earthquakes is by actually uh, class two injection into permeable formations that actually have some sort of fluid connection. Sorry about that. There we go. And that actually changes the stress state on the fault and causes it to slip. Um, most faults occur in, uh, 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 most earthquakes, induced earthquakes occur where there are faults, of course, that have to accommodate the slip. Uh, you have to have sufficient stress within the earth that may have been there for millions of years, but because the frictional state of the fault is sufficiently strong, they have not slipped until uh, uh, injection occurs. Um, even if there is stress in the region, it has to be optimally oriented to push the fault and make it slip. Um, injection fluids actually causes this effect by lowering the frictional strength of the fault by increasing the uh, what we call the pore pressure within the formation. Um, the upshot, though, it's important to realize there are almost 200,000 class two injection wells in the U.S., and less than one percent of these are actually uh, significant problems. Um, so I'll skip that one since it didn't play, right? Um, so earthquake activity in Oklahoma, here's the moment. Scale in Oklahoma, you see there's uh, this large sequence here in Prague, Oklahoma that really got a lot of attention and this is still ongoing. Um, during the past 10 years, we've seen this in other areas, uh, including a, a small event in Greeley last year. Um, the good news is, as we'll hear from our subsequent speakers, that this was rapidly recognized as an induced earthquake. Uh, COGCC and the well operator um, largely obviated this situation and mitigated it, and it has not been a problem since. Um, so uh, as of today, we're batting one for one in Colorado already in dealing with this problem. Obviously, it's a much bigger problem in Oklahoma. Um, Historical seismicity, I'll point out that we are the, uh, uh, the home front of induced earthquakes due to an unintentional experiment at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal in the 60s and 70s. In this case, they're actually injecting high pressure fluids directly into the basement, which no one does anymore. But they discovered that you can make that a prolific source of earthquakes uh, quite easily in this part of the world. Uh, injection into permeable formations above the basement, of course, is what uh, class two injection well operators really want to do uh, to uh, uh, um, address the issue of disposal of waste fluids. So the take home here is that this is a uh, geological interaction between pre-existing earthquake potential, the faults in the deep earth and the basement formations, and the perturbation of the stress state by human activities. Um, here we are. And uh, the level of susceptibility in Oklahoma appears to be a world-class exception. The vast majority of these wells do not correlate with significant earthquakes where they've been well monitored. That's even true in Oklahoma. Um, there's an increasingly strong track record of mitigating this phenomena, as the subsequent speakers will talk about here. Uh, so the news there is good. We know how to deal with this problem. Um, and uh, basically, we have to have well-informed regulation, good data. Um, and very infrequently, we have to go in and alter operations in class two injection well activities. And in this way, I think we can effectively mitigate this problem um, in the U.S. And the, the final 
message is that this is an eminently manageable issue. Thank you.